Now, directly give the floor to Nello Cristianini from the University of Bristol. He was also included among the most influential um, scientists of the decade from Thomson Reuters, so, and worked also on statistics in the University of California. I say that because he's from Italy, he works in the UK, uh, he's a, a scientist of the world. It's very important to, to hear his opinion and his speech, so the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yes, so we heard that uh, now we are in a time in which you find the negative news about artificial intelligence after a long time of mostly positive news and uh, things change fast and it may be confusing. And so I think my role should be, as always, um, for a scientist, just trying to explain things in a sort of calm way. So. Uh, it may be confusing for the public to go from a very positive hype to a very negative moment, so let us understand what is going on today. Maybe we can find a simple story that explains it. Uh, the kind of things that we started seeing in 2017 mostly are indeed concerning. For example, there are these stories about fake news and uh, the suspicion that uh, fake news might have influenced some election because social media recommended some type of stories to some individuals. That became a cause for concern. And uh, artificial intelligence was blamed as well. These are examples of the kind of stories that circulated during the US election. And in this case specifically, they're actually false. But in many cases, falseness isn't the problem. There can be biases. But this is an example of false news. That's part of why we hear negative coverage. Another cause for concern, all these stories about uh, psychographic information being extracted from users automatically and then being used to manipulate uh, voting decisions. There was a company who took credit for that. They feel they were important in the election in the UK and in the US. And because they took credit, the media covered it, and it became a cause for concern. And then we hear stories about software being used to make judicial decisions about uh, releasing prisoners on parole. And then uh, this also came out this year. And again this year, a story circulated about an insurance company using psychographic information to decide your risk levels as drivers and how much you should pay for, for your car insurance. And then, of course, we still are digesting this slightly older, older story about mass surveillance that has never gone away. It's still with us. Just because we don't discuss it so much, it doesn't mean we found a clever solution. It is just going on. So you're right. Uh, there are confusing messages, negative news. But the answer should come from understanding. How did we get to this point? So what is really happening? What is really happening? What is going on? It is, a, is it a conspiracy? Is there somebody? Well, the truth is, nothing really new is happening. This actually is a, an old story just applied to this very new technology of artificial intelligence. So let's try to make sense of all this. It will probably help us understand where we are heading. Really, it is two stories, and they are two good stories. I'm very happy about both of them. One is that uh, we finally had success in artificial intelligence. And for me, we working on this for more than 20 years, and for many colleagues working for much longer, this is a positive time. Things are happening after a long investment. And then at the same time, in the last decades, a global data infrastructure has emerged that we are using so much. And these two things are combining Actually, they are feeding onto each other, each of them empowering the other one in an accelerated way. So because of these two innovations, a series of events, a cascade of events happened that justifies and explains what we are witnessing. Good. <clears throat> so first, first things first, artificial intelligence. Um, well, um, until a few years ago, until the 90s, People expected intelligent behavior in machines to result, to come out in a very different way. 
uh, from reasoning logically, for machines to actually think in terms of uh, rules and logical rules that are known to the designer. So me, the artificial intelligence designer, would know all the facts and all the rules and make a system that can think about them. Chess was a good example. All the rules are known, play chess, proof theorems. So that was the idea, and that is how we imagined machines one day would think. But the truth is that for decades we invested in making machines that think logically about known facts, and we thought that this would give us AI, but we never had vision systems, we never had translation systems, or robot navigation, or speech recognition. But today we speak with Siri, the cars go around on their own, Google translates, your telephone can recognize your face, and all this is what we are trying to accomplish. That is a piece of proceedings from a very old conference in 1958, listing what they thought AI should do. And they were listing pattern recognition and learning and language translation and so on. All of that only became possible very recently. And it didn't happen by making systems that think logically about facts we tell them. Actually, it happened in a very different way, which is very relevant to us. The way we do artificial intelligence today is by gathering examples uh, of the behavior we wish to reproduce. We want lots of examples of transcribed bilingual speech. In fact, my group are using the European Parliament proceedings that are multilingual as a good example of multilingual text. Faces with their name or emails to discard. And then we train an algorithm, a learning algorithm, that can be used to predict future behavior in the machine. So that um, part of the learning algorithm is what I've been doing for a long time, for 20 years. How do you make an algorithm learn from examples? And that is what created everything else. Today we have AlphaGo, playing Go, learning from experience, Google Cars, learning from experience, um, spam filters, learning from experience, and so on. So machine learning is really what enabled everything. Look at Siri and Alexa, book recommendations. That's an example of a translation made by a statistical algorithm or spell checking. All that stuff on the screen may not look like artificial intelligence, but it is something that has only become possible in the last decade and before was a research goal very far. Good. So how do we get here? We got here by training learning algorithms. Machine learning plus data is what we call today artificial intelligence. And here is an interesting point. L Lady Lovelace, um, who is often quoted as a pioneer of programming, she, she, she was wrong. She was always quoted for saying that machines can only do things that we can explain to them carefully, exactly. But my colleagues who have built AlphaGo in London, they cannot beat AlphaGo, and they can't explain its moves, but they built it. Machines can do things that we don't understand and we don't know how to explain. And that's the point of machine learning. And that's the point that will be relevant later. Machines can do things that we don't know how to explain. Well, intelligent agents are often driven by correlations. Uh, correlations found in the data. These are not the same as explanations of the phenomenon. If I want to recommend a book to you, I can do it by detecting correlations in your past behavior and in the book's history. I don't need to know why you will buy that book, or your personality, or your literary taste. And the same is for the moves of AlphaGo and so on. So this, I think, is actually a scientific discovery that happened in the past, and that, uh, in the last few years, and we are uh, not recognizing as a piece of science the behavior of people can actually be predicted simply based on correlations about their past behavior. This is something I think one day will find its way into the books of psychology and sociology. We can predict what most of us will do in, in typical situations just by looking at their past behavior without making a model of them. And uh, this can, of course, be used to build machines that emulate people's behavior. So a popular book that was discussing this revolution of big data talks about this in this way, correlation trumps causation. You don't need to know causal explanations. Just notice correlations, 
may be approximate probabilistic explanations in the data. And the data is everywhere. And that's the other part. And so people invented this notion of the data as the new oil. So I will do a quick example, really briefly. That's how you make a credit score. A credit score is to predict your risk of not paying back the debt. And you collect information about the history of the, of the applicant. But the same information that has been found can be used to predict if they will take their medication as patients. It seems unclear why. We don't have a reason to understand why. But given enough data, um, this company was able to find a correlation between their credit, uh, the, the, the variables that inform credit behavior to their medical adherence. And they were able to make an index that can predict this. And that's an example of how they market it. This is FICO, but other people can do it. Uh, they would show that people, for example, on a, this is an example of a college educated renting single mother uh, can uh, get their medication more, oft more often if she receives coupons and SMS communications. Fine. So that is the kind of information they can leverage. Not understanding, just correlation. And the same data you can buy from data brokers, by the way, the same data you can uh, use to predict election behaviors, voting behavior, and so on. So that's a little example of how we can emulate human behavior by having, if we have enough data to train on. And that is how, a few years back, everybody was talking about data as the new oil. Even here, of course, towards a data-driven economy for Europe, delivering a digital single market, and so on and so on. Data was going to be this one solution to everything. And that created a lot of expectations. Which brings me to the second part of the explanation. How did we get all this data? Because if I wanted to build an intelligence system in this way 20 years ago, I couldn't have done it. How would I have gotten all this data? Well, um, that's the second story. How did you get all this data? Examples of people's behavior, purchasing, email, location, face, news, reading habits. Well, this is the other thing. In the past, we made use, of course, of different infrastructures, you know, the telephone and the bank and the regular mail and the newspapers and so on. And uh, these are fundamentally different separated infrastructures, but in the last 20 years, we've been migrating very fast towards this one single unified infrastructure that is taking their place, which is becoming a new medium. And this new medium, um, of course, uh, can now do shopping, entertainment, news, payments, and so on. So how did we get to this new place where we use the same infrastructure? Because this is relevant to understanding. Well, one fundamental factor that was actually studied a lot was that uh, it allowed us, it promised to bypass intermediators. That's an important point. Before the web, there was a huge reliance on on people who controlled access, the gatekeepers, who controlled access to, to the media. How can a politician be elected without having any social media? They would have to have a good relation with the publisher. How can an artist publish a book or a song? They must have access to the publishing industry. But even you, if you want to make a book your trips, you must have a travel agent. How would you advertise your services to an advertising company? That was a world full of intermediators, gatekeepers, people in the middle, Middlemen, those who sat in the middle, and in the middle of the value chain of the economy, if you want, controlling access. If you just want to know what a gatekeeper looks like, look no further than Harvey Weinstein. These are gatekeepers, people in the position to control things. And of course people felt that it was a good moment and a good innovation to build an infrastructure that allows you to sell products directly from the producer to the customer, to publish a book, to write an article, to disclose uh, wrongdoings. That was obviously a liberating moment. So the power to disintermediate actually is behind a lot of that for the economy, for democracy, for society. Disintermediation was seen as a step towards more democratization, removing extra control from the middle, giving power directly to the people, so to speak. That was the language, the feeling of the early web. Increasing the power of the many, decreasing the power of the few. So that was a, a, a promise. And I think, I actually think autonomy for most of us increased in the first part of this revolution. 
we have seen how videos of police brutality. Would those same videos have gone on television 20 years ago? Whistleblowing on corporations and politicians. Would that have happened? But even just price comparison, just knowing which hotel has the cheapest room in this city at the same time prevents the hotels from playing complicated games against us, forcing people to compete. So it worked. It was behind a lot of the new business models. We adopted it. We migrated. We saved money. We increased our autonomy. We replaced a lot of these power structures. That is part of the big revolution of the web. So look at this. You can compare prices on your mobile for products, for hotels, for news. You can force them to compete. You can create a reverse auction. They must now lower their, actually, a normal auction. They want to, to bid for you. And you have all this information on your phone. Surely this is what we were hoping for in the beginning. At the same time as you make your choice, you're giving them some data. Which hotel have you picked? What time of the day was it? Where were you? How much did you pay? So the company providing this service may get a commission for, for the transaction, and may, they get extra data to analyze. It seemed like a fair deal. We got a service. We gave some data. Sometimes they don't even get the commission. They just want the data. So what is the real business model? Getting commissions or just observing people's behavior? How do they make their money? But this data is what made artificial intelligence possible. That is how we collected mail, um, deletion of spam emails, and so on. So at the same time, this perfect match happened. A new infrastructure was created um, to, to enable us to do things. We couldn't use that infrastructure without artificial intelligence. So it's a fair step. You can't use a library with a billion books if you don't have an index. You can't even find the first book. YouTube is bigger than a billion books. You can't find a single video if you don't have a, a recommendation system, an engine that allows you to search for the video. There is no modern web without artificial intelligence. And there is no artificial intelligence without the modern web collecting all this data for it to analyze and learn and emulate human behavior and make recommendations. So the system started feeding onto itself. More AI, more usage of the web, even more AI, and so on. And that accelerated very fast. This enormous, vast mass of data became very quickly available. And that is one reason why there is such a fast advance in AI today, because the data is available. And there is now a business model and a way to deliver it. So that is how these two innovations came together and there was a name for the data that we could analyze that was not generated in the lab. We called it data in the wild, data already pre-existing out there that we could go out there and, and source. I can just get some, well, the European Parliament proceedings I used to, to learn how to translate in my group. That's data already existing, natural language made by clever translators. Why not using it, data in the wild? But then we could use uh, blogs and discussion boards and likes on Facebook and purchases. All of that exists anyway. Deliveries, watching patterns on your smart television. That's all data already there, data in the wild. Let's learn from it. So in the last five to 10 years, everybody was talking about data, data science, big data, the new oil, data in the wild. That was the deal. We got free stuff in return for allowing companies to collect our data. That was this unspoken deal we made. Give us free stuff, and uh, we will give you our free data. We'll let you look. We'll let you even speak in our children's ears, perhaps. Just, you know, that's the deal. And everything was fine. The system was working. It was growing. It is still growing, and it was empowering us and improving our autonomy. Until one day, when we started seeing this, and that day, People were extremely surprised. We realized, look at that. Uh, the NSA has a massive database of Americans' phone calls, an optic nerve, a million Yahoo webcams, images intercepted by GCHQ. And WikiLeaks claim that the CIA and MI5 can spy through your smartphones in the television, and so on. And the floodgates opened. And since then, there was no stopping. 
it kept on coming and coming and coming, and people started dealing with it and understanding that what is going on. We just welcomed all this technology in our life, and now, for the first time, there are some things we don't quite like. And the first thought was, well, I don't want that. By the way, I don't think it was that surprising, to be honest. So this is the example of a, one of the – Guardian has this on the website, true or false. This is a leaked slide by Snowden on the website of the Guardian. I hope it's true. I don't know. And they, um, here they suggest that all of these companies could provide data to the security services. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. I can't say. It is just being claimed by the Guardian. And people were extremely shocked to find this out. But what else did we expect? If we migrate everything into a single digital format and we send it through a communication line that we can't control, any understanding of history would say, well, somebody's going to have to buy a big disk and save it. So, okay, I didn't like it either. I wasn't that surprised, though. But the point is that when this thing happened, when this penny dropped, people started thinking about it. And they realized a very important thing, that they could no longer opt out. So the first thought for many was, okay, I'll not use my smartphone. I'll not go on Google anymore. I'll buy things in the shop. I'll use the telephone box. I don't need all this. When on that day is when we realized we can't get out of this. So that is part of what is happening, this awakening. We can't function without being part of the system, but the system can monitor our activities, which we don't like also. Now, that was a step. The media started thinking and we started thinking, no solutions, of course, the usual hysterical negativity, but and mass surveillance and passive logging of activities actually wasn't the full story. That was not all. A lot of new stuff happened, which explains why people are turning a little worried now. Here is the thing about people. If something is legal and makes money, somebody will do it. Why not? So if data collection and exploitation can be done, well, people will do as much as they can to do it legally to make money. So there are businesses called data brokers who collect personal data about people, package it, curate it, and sell it. Actually, it is not a scandal. This is so long as they are within the boundaries. But we must know the personal data collection is underway. Are we surprised? I'm not that surprised. So in 2008, the Obama campaign was quite advanced in uh, doing micro-targeting, individual micro-targeting, using data from data brokers, past purchasing behavior of individuals, combining it with electoral records, doing some interviews, learning some patterns, and identifying individuals who may vote or change mind or swing. So that, that is from the Wired magazine from many years ago, 10 years nearly ago. You have uh, different types of customers having different voting tendencies. No longer swing states, no longer swing counties. These are individuals that you can identify. 2008, using public, I mean, purchasable data. So that starts becoming interesting because now you, you may have an impact on elections. 2016, eight years later, the Trump campaign. Here is a company claiming that they've been able to use psychographic data about individuals to add to the profile of users, along with their past behavior, to make even better predictions. The five personality traits they claim to be able to infer, they were openness, conscientiousness, extraversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. That's quite surprising. How do they know my personality? Well, here is an interesting one, because it, it teaches us a lot. A few years ago, on PNAS, a couple of papers appeared, very, very interesting in which somebody asked a very interesting question. If I give people a psychological questionnaire and I get an answer out of it, and if I do it for 60,000 people or whatever, could I find out the same answer without actually them taking the test? Could I bypass the test? Could I disintermediate again? Can I use their online behavior to predict what the outcome of the test will be? Let's try. They say that they collected uh, through a Facebook app um, the personality test for tens of thousands of people who consented to take the test as a game. Um, they also released the, the permission to uh, mine their own posts and likes. 
and the machine learning algorithm was used to find a mapping directly for the Facebook posts to their personality. And it was found that it was possible to predict the type of personality without actually taking the test. That is the paper, two or three years old, maybe four years old. It's an example of how fast things move. You go from a purely research paper to a product deployed in, elec in an election in three years. That's a challenge for regulation when you go from the first academic paper to the final result in three years. This, this was not the normal way you would deploy a telegraph in the day. In the same year, 2016 uh, or 17, um, this insurance company in the UK used the same information, psychometrics from social media, to assess the risk of drivers and decide how much they should pay for their car insurance. And that um, was rolled back. And again, it took very few years from the paper to the product and the media campaign. So that was very interesting, but it wasn't all. Why we are so unsettled? Because other things have been happening at the same time, and the news started getting a habit of reporting negative news. Look at this one. This one was actually very interesting. Those two people in the photo were labeled as gorillas by um, the Google um, image classification algorithm. Keep in mind, image content classification used to be impossible a few years ago. Ten years ago, you couldn't have a product like this. Now it's very good that you can recognize an object or a person in an image. It's a remarkable success. Those two individuals in America, two African-Americans, were na uh, labeled as gorillas. It became a scandal. It became incredibly embarrassing for the company. They apologized profusely. What happened? Fall play? Anybody cheated? No. This is exactly my everyday experience as I build these things. Mistakes happen all the time. Normally, they happen all the time. Nobody wanted this. You just have to know what training data was used, how was the testing done, was performance tested in the same conditions in which it was deployed, and so on. It is normal that these things happen. The system is just learning to do its best in terms of minimizing errors. It doesn't know that some errors are much worse than other errors, and unless you think about it, you implement it. But this created a scandal. And this, somebody found a racial bias in the, in the ads that uh, um, um, Google serves. So Google will serve ads based on your searches, certain searches that can be linked to African-American uh, topics or names produce um, uh, embarrassing outcomes, something about criminal record history and so on. Why? Well, that is a fully automated feedback loop. The system is just trying to maximize the click-throughs and to maximize people clicking. So it must have found some indirect correlation between certain names and certain clicks. And it will just recommend more and more. It is doing exactly what it's meant to do. The polling is that uh, we as a society don't like to, to discriminate against people. And we, and we shouldn't like, and, and the system doesn't know it. And then again, women likely to be shown ads for cheaper jobs than men. Again, same story. It's not like anybody sat down to discriminate against women. They built a system that learns from data in the wild, collected from public activities, and they turned this into a recommendation engine. And if there is bias existing already in the data in the wild, it will leak into the model and it will feed into the behavior of the agent. Our big discovery, we can just source data from the wild and train our systems. They will learn unexpected hidden correlations that we can't understand. They will make predictions. Yes, they will. They do. But what if the outside data is biased? Well, they will learn the bias and they will use it. What, what are we expecting here? I've been analyzing with my group uh, bias in media content for 12 years. I keep on getting you know, endless amounts of data. We have 150 years of newspapers from the British Library. We know gender bias. We know other biases, topic and race and so on. Media content is biased, of course. We are learning from it, fine. We are going to learn something biased. We just have to understand what we are trying to do, what we want to avoid, where it is acceptable, where it, it isn't acceptable. It's a matter of understanding. The idea that we build a black box, it will make a miracle and make us money automatically for free Maybe it was a little naive. Now, having seen all this, 
Anybody wants some machine justice. A machine learning system trained on past data that is predicting who can be released on bail, on parole, who is going to come back, who is going to disappear. This is happening, right? I don't say it's a bad idea. I just say maybe let us start from predicting if you pay the parking ticket or maybe let's start from predicting something simple if you are going to buy milk tomorrow and then let's learn from it and build up. Not sure why we are, build, we are starting from people's personal liberty. But this is happening. And biases exist. Nobody has to mean any evil. These things can happen. So let us be very careful. When we classify or make a prediction about an object, it is a bit different than making a prediction about a person because a person will have rights and certain things are no longer acceptable. And so far, we as engineers were extremely good at classifying things and we transferred the same skills to classifying people and their access to opportunities, information, education, loans, and so on. Well, let us keep in mind that these are people with rights and our society has already a framework to think about those things. Which brings me to the big topic of fake news. Actually, I don't think it is that big, but fake news has been mentioned a lot in the last few days. Um, that is a total AI story because the software is trying to find out what you are going to click on and recommend it to you based on your past behavior. That's the feedback loop. That's the famous filter bubble. So based on the kind of things you and your friends click on, the system will give you more and more of the same. This feedback loop could probably uh, lead to polarization because it is also known that your personal beliefs and opinions are shaped by what you read. And what you read is shaped by your opinions, and that's another feedback loop. So these are examples. 960,000 people were exposed to the Pope story about endorsing Trump. 789,000 people exposed to the Hillary selling weapons to ISIS story. And I bet few people in this room ever saw this ad. And the reason is that it was shown to the right people. And you don't belong to that category. You are not voters in the US, most of you, and you are not part of the same ideological community, I suppose. But the right people were shown this. More of the same. That's the idea. Give me more of the same. Machine learning plus personal data gives you personalized recommendation. A big business. But if there is a bias in the outside world, the system will learn it and use it. So where does this leave us? Well, this is leaving us to this place. What we have built is a new mass medium. In the sense of the theory of mass media, in the sense of Marshall McLuhan, it's a new medium. This is not the same as the telegraph or the telephone or the television. This thing isn't a wire of copper transmitting pulses from A to B. This thing understands its content. It can decide what you get to see, what should be censored, what should be recommended. It looks back at us. It has got a good reason to take interest in our actions, to learn from them. It remembers everything. So this is what's happening in 2017. We have adopted a new mass medium that is fundamentally different than what we had before. That's it. It's not a conspiracy. There is no Russian hackers. We have adopted this new medium for a good reason. And now we find out that not everything is perfect. That's it. Privacy is a concern. Bias is a concern. Transparency is a concern. Power shift is a concern. But it doesn't mean AI is, is, is evil. I, I, I want to believe we can keep on doing AI with the right regulations. So AI machine learning are there for a reason, to generalize and to personalize. And we can benefit from that. So now, let's just absorb this. We built a new medium, and we put it at the center of our lives. The first time we meet AI, it is a moment in which we can't opt out, and it is in the position to influence us very much. Um, it looks at us. It learns from us. It can learn also things we don't like about us. We can't do it without anyway. If I may, this promise or the disintermediation was a little bit optimistic. I don't think we removed the intermediators, the gatekeepers. We have replaced them with algorithms. That is, I think, an important point. The algorithms 
are now in the same position to decide what information people can get. Now, this brings us to a very interesting new challenge for all of us, which is the topic of, of this meeting. How do we live with intelligent machines? If we can't get out and we can't turn them off and they exist and they give us challenges, how do we coexist? And that's, I think, my, my important topic. How do we earn trust? How do we ensure the public that there is fairness and transparency, privacy, accountability in these systems? How do we regulate these things? What kind of things can be acceptable and what cannot? I mean, we don't want to turn it off. We just want to make sure that nobody gets harmed. I think, actually, the GDPR is a great step. I'm, I, I, the more I, I read it, the more I like it. It doesn't solve everything, but it does solve some things. We should take it seriously. There are many interesting ideas in the GDPR. One thing I would like to suggest, if I may, to the Parliament, look out for how it will be implemented. If it becomes another disclaimer that you must accept in order to enter into a search engine, you wasted six years of work. It has to be more than that. If people will tell you one day that uh, we can't do AI anymore in the same way, the answer should be, that is the point of laws. It has to be done in a slightly different way. Let us talk. So next challenges. The Internet of Things is coming. More data will be collected. Cashless society is being pushed a lot. More data will be collected. Some colleagues of mine are very enthusiastic of the idea of algorithmic regulation, having algorithms that replace law enforcement and they administer rewards and punishments. Let's be careful. The same nonlinear feedback loops that we've seen in all the other examples might very well show up in this. Be skeptical when they ask you to deploy quickly algorithmic regulation slash cashless society slash internet of things because if you don't do it quickly and fast and if they don't have an exception from the law, something bad will happen to the economy. You will hear that. But let's keep in mind, you don't want to meet the next day with the next fake news panic attack in which something else is going wrong. There is still time now to plan ahead. In particular, the, these three notions of algorithmic regulation and clash, cashless society sound a lot like another round of disintermediation, which will mean, again, putting algorithms as mediators once more. Keep it in mind. But I want to be positive because I like what I'm doing, I think we're doing well, and I want to say, how do we earn trust? It is on us to earn trust. And uh, I think uh, AI can be more explainable, it can be more fair. We may need new institutions. People talk a lot about some sort of food and drug administration for algorithms. How can you certify something is going to be fair and non-discriminating and unbiased? Should we break monopolies and make them compete for more trust? These are discussions that at some point we must have. Should we trust uh, to use AI in places where public opinion can be affected? Again, not, shouldn't stop anything. Don't get me wrong. This is a great success. What we have seen in the last few five, ten years, it's an incredible success. And by the way, we all paid for it. This is a lot of public money spent. We got what we wanted to get. AI works. Now, let us be careful, though. We need also the right laws, the right, cul right cultural steps, there will be more deployment of more AI in society as we keep on speaking. This is the beginning. So it was not an anomaly of the year, 2017. It was not an exception. It was the first year or many years like this. So let us think about this thing. Um, we need more ideas. The fundamental idea is simple. There is just no free lunch. It is childish to believe you get something for free. That stuff is the side effect of the good stuff we have. And every other industry needed some thinking, some regulation, some adjusting. This is no different. So it is for us to look after our future. It is not for the engineers only. Actually, I must say, particularly, it is not for the engineers. Some solutions will be technical. The vast majority of the solutions will become from philosophers, humanities, journalists, scientists, politicians, citizens. It's a matter of introducing a huge amount of new ideas into this discussion. So thank you for inviting me. Let us get to work. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor, for this uh, excellent presentation. Um, I have, uh, I, 
I am concerned, but I think I have many uh, questions uh, answered. So thank you so much. I understand we have to have more events with you because the field is huge and it's now starting. <laughs> <laughs>